Thank you, Teddy, and the team. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn with me to Luke chapter 23. Luke 23, we'll be reading from verse 26 to 31. Now, we've been reading, uh, singing, reading, singing about Jesus' Messiah. Now, this idea of Messiah was a story that the, the Hebrew people started telling amongst themselves around the time of the Exodus, and stories of it probably existed before that. So this is 1200 B.C. that that story started to work its way through the Hebrew people. That's 3,200 years ago. In the time of David, this starts to be solidified that the Messiah would become a king of God in the line of David. In other words, this ancient story that we've just been singing about tonight is a story about God becoming king, Messiah. Last week we started this journey when we looked at the enthronement of the Messiah and we saw that it was not what we might expect. The the Messiah was enthroned on a cross. That's what we're looking towards. However, locked up in the story of this enthronement, this God becoming king, is this idea that when God does become king, he is bringing his righteous judgment to the earth. When he comes, it will be a terrible day. What the Old Testament describes as the terrible or terrifying day of the Lord. God is coming. His king will be set up in Jerusalem. And everything that's evil in the world will be condemned and everything that is good will be vindicated. That is the story. That's what we see this week. That judgment is coming. But again, as Luke has been doing, uh, doing, sorry, doing, 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 is that it, it... It subverts our expectations all over again. The judgment doesn't come as we might expect it to. So let's read together. In Luke chapter 23, verse 26 to 31, it says there, and this is the word of the Lord. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. And Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never have nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if the people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? May the Lord bless the reading of his word tonight. Now, as I said, this is a subversion of judgment that Luke is doing. The day of the Lord is upon us. Jesus announces this. This terrifying day of the Lord is upon us. And it's not expected to be what will be. In fact, what God did and what people expected are literal miles apart. Well, not literal, but miles apart. See, the first problem that would be encountered with this idea of the day of the Lord is that everyone who expected it thought that it would be a single event. When the Messiah came, that would be the end of all evil. However, us living in 2,000 years since Christ, there's a slight gap between the terrible day of the Lord and the terrible day of the Lord. Because judgments come. That's what's been announced by Luke. And yet there is a delay for when judgment will come. And what I want to show you tonight is actually only the outcasts who are brought into the safety of the Messiah and everyone else is cast out and judged, including the great city Jerusalem. We see this in our first point tonight, which is woman and dry sticks. Jesus' statement to the daughters of Jerusalem is, is profound. 
Because it's a, it's a condemnation. It's a judgment against the people of Jerusalem, that ancient city. It's profound judgment. And in fact, Jesus uses what's called apocalyptic literature, which is a, a type of writing that was developed, or at least um, kind of started in the exile in Babylon. And the Jews really got into it and started to write a lot of their later prophets use this language, which is symbolic language that speaks about worldly events from a heavenly perspective. And so there's an eschatological end times, apocalyptic, symbolic language that's used to describe an event that is coming. And what is that event? Well, the city of peace, Jerusalem. Literally, Jerusalem means the city of peace. Jerusalem, the city of peace will be will need to be judged by the God who established her. Jerusalem, I mean, this is like a, a crazy idea, but God said, my presence will dwell in Jerusalem. I mean, that famous psalm that we called you to when, when Israel was struck, pray for the priests of Jerusalem. This is where God has established His name. I mean, just think about that contrast. A city built... For the glory of God. And yet when its king is in it. When he's about to be enthroned. He says. Woe to you. In fact. So profound is the judgment that he says. It is better that you do not have children. Now again. In the 21st century. This has become a bit of like a weird I don't know what happened to the species where we decided that having children is optional. Like, it's just not. And in fact, this is a side, this is for free, this is a little bit of a rant. I've got to do this. I think we've messed up society. Everyone says, like, no, really, go get a job, establish yourself, and then have kids because you, then you can afford them. There's two problems with this idea. Firstly, you will never afford kids. Just throwing that out there. They're an endless hole of money. But the second thing is, most of you think you will establish yourself by your 30s. And the statistics are, is the day you turn 30, your chances of having kids drops by half. We've got it backwards. You should be having kids and then figuring out what you're doing later. Not advice from the pulpit, just a you know, suggestion. <laughs> So we've messed this up. So every society before ours, if you said to them, do not have kids, it would be better that you did not have kids. They wouldn't be thinking, hmm, yeah, wise financial decisions there. <laughs> They'd be saying, what is going on with the world that we wouldn't want to have kids? And Jesus is saying this is judgment. There's such a bad judgment coming that it's better that you never have children. But who does he give this to? He gives this warning to women. To the woman walking behind the Messiah who are wailing. The, the ones who are rejected and outcast in society. And he says to them, here is a warning. Be prepared. Jerusalem will be judged and lost. The city of peace will not embrace the prince of peace. And she will be subjected to utter ruin. In fact, this is the meaning of Jesus' green tree and, and dry tree statement, which we'll explain later. In fact, all that awaits God's people, and I, mean, I, I, I can't emphasize this enough, all that awaits God's people and God's city is His absolute rejection of it. And His wrath-filled anger. Again, Jerusalem, the city of peace, has rejected the God who established her and thus is subject to her judgment, her, His judgment. The Prince of Peace will not bring peace, but judgment. And the city will fall under the sword, which leads us to the second point, Jerusalem and the day of the Lord. I want to read the words again of Jesus where he says, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For when the time comes, they will say, Blessed are the children, well, sorry, the childless woman, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. 
Then they will say, and hear these words, church, hear these words tonight. They will say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For people did these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it's dry? I just want to say, many a thesis has been written on this statement. It's cryptic as anything, as all apocalyptic language is. But Jesus is pointing to something of a judgment. I mean, that's obvious. That's what we've been establishing tonight. What Jesus does is he quotes a famous Old Testament prophet, the prophet of Hosea, chapter 10, where he says, will the mountains fall of us, will the hills cover us? And in that prophecy, Hosea is saying to the nation of Israel, you have abandoned your God, and when he comes, you will cry out to be crushed by the very mountains and hills instead of facing the wrath of God. We don't like to think about Jesus that way, right? Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. No. When you see him come, you will wish to be crushed by the hills, to be covered by the mountains. In fact, these words would come true on this ancient city in just 40 years. In AD 70, the Roman army would march into this ancient city and destroy it so that not one stone was left on another, utterly wiping it off the face of the earth. This is the judgment coming. It's coming to Jerusalem. It's been prophesied throughout the Old Testament. However, what Jesus does is, because he uses this apocalyptic language, it's instantly connected to the actual judgment of the whole of the earth. And, and what I'm trying to paint, I know it sounds harsh, but I don't think I'm doing a good job actually tonight. I want to paint how terrifying this is. Because Jesus is talking not only about the city of Jerusalem, but the end of the entire world. When Messiah comes, judgment is coming with him, and apocalyptic, literally world-ending judgment follows him. This is one of the hopes of both the Old Testament and the New Testament, that when God comes as the righteous judge, he will come as righteous judge and he'll cast his final judgment upon the earth. He'll cast his judgment on the earth. Only God can judge me is the mantra of our age. That should terrify us. That should fill us with mountain-crushing, wishing horror. Only way I can illustrate this. When I was a kid, I was an angel. I really was. Angel of a kid. So good. So well-behaved. Anyway, one of our high school classes, we had a particularly, um, let's just call him aggressive science teacher. He's quite an intense guy. And uh, so we did, the one thing we didn't do is mess around in his class. Like, and I was in, like, you got the bad class, which was 12H, and then anyone who didn't make it into 12H got into 12J. That was my class. Uh, we started out in grade 11 with, uh, you know, a group of people. Uh, by grade 12, halfway through, we only had half the class left because everyone else was either pregnant or had been expelled or had just given up on school. We were, we were the top, you know, top players. The school looked at us and said, this class is going somewhere. <laughs> we were in that class, yeah. I don't know how I got there. I was an angel. Anyway, so th the teacher leaves and literally, I actually wasn't doing anything bad. I'd happened to actually just go and throw away a piece of paper, and as the teacher was walking, the quickest way to my desk was behind his desk. Little did I know that there were exams under his desk. And so here's me happily walking through past his desk, and he walks and he goes, Brokershaw, what are you doing? And like, you know when you're so afraid that you actually think you might lose your... Uh, <laughs> It's only ever happened to me once, literally once in my life, and that was when uh, the teacher caught me behind his desk, and I didn't know there were exams. I literally, I was like, 
broken. I was like, I nearly lost my footing. Now that's half of the fear of awaits us when the true judge of the earth comes. There's nowhere to hide. You're caught. You're done. It's terrifying. And we're likely to brush over these words, aren't we? You know, we read through these words and we think, ah, that's for sinners. That's for the others. However, this is for God's city. Jerusalem. The city of peace. How much more terrifying will it be for those who are outside of God's will, His people, His city? However, in the middle of this narrative enters a stranger, and he literally is, who's thrust into the middle of the narrative. This man, Simon. And this is our third point. Why, why Simon? Why Simon? On some level, the addition of Simon of Cyrene seems like an arbitrary addition to the story. In fact, there are some commentators who say it is, it is so forced on the narrative that it almost detracts from its actual telling. And so some commentators have said the only reason the gospel writers, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, put this in is because it happened. I didn't like that, that explanation. Luke is too beautifully crafted. The, the art of Luke's gospel is just too held together, too locked into itself to have something injected into it that is arbitrary. And so Luke puts the story of Simon into his story because it points out something vital. And what is that? Well, Simon is an outsider. I mean, it literally says he was coming in from the country into the city. He had no clue what was going on. He was literally as lost as anyone could possibly be. And he's dragged into it. However, what's incredible, what's not picked up, but would have been absolutely evident to every single one of Luke's original audience, was who Simon of Cyrene eventually becomes. You see, Simon of Cyrene is saved through this event. How do I get that? Well, Mark tells us that two of his children, Alexander and Rufus, become pillars of the early church. Mark 15, verse 21. Tradition states that they were actually great missionaries and including some of the, the great standing names of the early church of Rome. These were superheroes in the early church. In other words, and this is what's insane about the story, a completely haphazard outsider stumbles into an event that forever changes his life and this family's life and the life of the early church. And I think it's here that Luke's point comes into clarity. Simon is the outsider. He's the nobody. He's the one literally lost. Take that as you may. And he comes into the story and is literally put under the cross. Pick up what Luke's trying to say. It's the outsider, the person disconnected from the judgment that is thrown under the cross. In fact, this connects back to the woman. When God's judgment comes upon the earth, Jesus announces to the woman, again outsiders, and says, Don't weep for me, children or daughters of Jerusalem. Weep for yourselves. Why? Because again, it's the outsider coming in and weeping. We don't like verses like this, church. We don't like passages like this because they paint an uncomfortable picture. However, we need to realize, church, I think more today we can see this than I think in, in times of recent history. The world needs weeping. 
It's not a great place. The world is under judgment. Sinful mankind is under curse and wrath right now. And so don't weep for something else. Don't weep for the Messiah. Weep for yourself. Weep for your country. Become like that outsider, like Simon, who would fall under the cross and be a substitute. See, we often miss, what we often miss is that the cross is the beginning of God's wrath. It's the start of the fund, final judgment. Jesus, the perfect outsider, the one who doesn't deserve any of this wrath, stumbles into this world, and I use that word loosely, and is thrust under the wrath of God, under the cross. He's placed under our burden, our wrath. And the terrible day of the Lord is poured out upon one person, upon Jesus. So that now, in the post-cross world, it is only those who weep for themselves that cling to the Savior for His final salvation. You see, this is the weird thing about this passage. Is it actually paints for us the exact pathway of salvation. No one gets into the heaven, or gets into heaven. No one gets into the kingdom without weeping. Without weeping for themselves, for the world, for the judgment that has come and is coming. You see, church, for anyone who believes in Jesus, their weeping stops because they've already wept over their sins and realized that they themselves need to go under the cross, but someone else stood in their place. And so when the king comes back again, and he's coming, he's promised that he will, everyone who's not wept now will weep then. They will cry and long for the mountains to crush them, for the hills to hide them. Why? Because their sins still wait this terrifying day of wrath. But for those who weep now, and this is the beauty of it, for those who identify themselves as the outsiders, for those who don't belong, God will not hold them to account twice. Every single one of their sins, His wrath has been poured out upon Jesus. Every wrong has been judged. Every misdeed has been counted on the cross. And here's the whole thing that we often miss. No one is getting away with anything. Not a soul. No one is getting away with anything. This is why they want the mountains to crush them. Because they're going to be caught out. They're going to be exposed. But here's what we miss. Here's what we end to. If you're not willing to be exposed in terms of on the cross, you haven't got this. You need judgment. That's the message. You need to weep for yourself. Or else you will weep when the King comes again. But as we weep, as our sins are recognized, we realize we have only one hope. Why does Jesus, let's go back a couple of weeks ago, why does Jesus say to the woman who weeps at his feet, she loves much because she's forgiven much? Because she's wept. She's realized how much she owes. It's not a nice message to preach on a Sunday night. But we need to weep. 
Because those who mourn will be comforted. And every sin that you have been exposed about, every heart pain at the wretchedness of who you are exposed, is covered by a love that you could not begin to understand. I've never really told you my testimony. I'm going to end with it. It's a weird one. That's why I don't share it a lot. I was saved at a pretty young age, I would say. I was five years old. Like I said, I was an angel. My mother took me to a revival meeting. And on the first day, I said, I want to go give my life to Jesus. She said, no, you don't understand. Second day, I was like, later, mom, I'm going to go give my life to Jesus. And I just ran down the aisle. Eventually, she found me like a couple of, you know, whatever it was. For me, it felt like hours. Time just makes no sense as a kid. And I'd given my life to Jesus. I was in the prayer room. They were like telling me things and whatever. And I was like, yeah, I've got this. This is Jesus is awesome, you know. And I was. I was radical for him. I was like, I'm going to be a pastor and a helicopter pilot because Airwolf was on TV at that stage. <laughs> and as a five-year-old, I wasn't an idiot. So I knew pastors earned nothing. So I was like, I'm going to have to like double this, you know. I'm going to have to earn some money. And helicopter pilot's my jam. And that changed a lot. The pastor remained pretty constant, but like when uh, there was the Wimbledon was on, I was, I'm going to be Andre Agassi. I'm going to be a tennis player and a pastor. I'm going to balance those two things. Anyway, my teenage years, uh, we went through some rough times, and, and I just walked away completely. Just gave up. Did things that I will not share on a Sunday night. Uh, in fact, uh, I went on two matric holidays. I was such a disaster. And I wasn't going for the parties. I was going for the parties. Um, in fact, I went to summer camp in 2001. Partly drunk. Literally got back that, that's, that day and I went on the next day. I was a mess. On summer camp, it wasn't even great worship. It wasn't even good sermons. I mean, they were okay. And it was actually during a song that, I mean, it's a, gr it's a good song, but it just doesn't connect with me anymore. I really, I struggle to worship it even today. It was, this is the air that I breathe. You know that song? Some people love it. I just don't get it. I don't know. Like, it doesn't connect with you. It was in that song. I was just hit with a ton of, like, I can't even describe to you how overwhelmed with how broken I was. How messed up by sin I was. And I literally fell to my knees in the middle of this worship. I must have looked weird. Because again, it wasn't a great song and it wasn't done that well. And I fell to my knees in the middle of summer camp. Fortunately, it's dark, so no one really <laughs> noticed. And it was instant. It was weird. And I don't know how to describe this. And so bear with me. This is weird. I'm going to just tell you this. In my mind flame came out from me and moved across the entirety of the, the hall. You know how it just, just is if anyone's been there? And everyone was consumed in it. Literally everyone just burnt up. I know it wasn't happening. It was in my mind. I know this, but this is what I saw. And I fell over flat because I knew this was judgment. And I knew I didn't measure up. And I saw Jesus. I didn't see his face. I saw him walking towards me. And I was terrified. I was terrified. Because I was exposed. And the image that I got was he walked up to me and just put his arms on me on the floor and said, it's okay. I, I forgive you. It's done. I love you. And that changed my life. I've literally never gone back. I mean, I've messed up. I haven't walked perfectly. But that encounter taught me something. And I've clung to greater times than some, but I've always clung to it. Now my sins, though they were many, He's taken them. They're His. And they're mine no more. Church is coming again. 
This time he's not coming to hug us, you know, in my image. He's coming with a sword. He's coming to destroy that which is against him. Our only hope is that we embrace him while there is time. I know many of you have. But I want to lay this on you tonight. There's a world out there that is a second away from flames. Pastor, I used to have growing up, you would say, perhaps today, he said that every single Sunday, in terms of maybe Jesus is coming, perhaps today, and it's true, there's nothing holding back Jesus from coming. There's a world under judgment. And we have good news. We have such good news that anyone who comes to him, he will take their sins upon himself and pay fully for their wrath so that we will receive nothing but his love. That's what we go out with this week. That's what we hope in. That is our evangelion, our good news, our gospel. Nothing more, nothing less. Let's go out in that. Let's live in that. Let's meditate on that every second of our day. I've never gotten tired of it, and I pray you don't either. Let's pray. Lord, as you draw us tonight into the terror of the cross, may we weep. Because that is our cross. That horror is our horror. It's, it's what we deserve. And it's you in love bore it all, paid the price, and it is finished. You will remember our sins no more. What a miracle. I pray we would live in that tonight. We'd live in that tomorrow. We'd live in that for the rest of our lives. And we'd call all who would hear to the wonderful news that there is hope. There's hope to escape the terrible day of the Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you stand as we sing our closing?